ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. I'm Mita Sen, and I'll be your MC for this evening Parmi Kalsuri event. This evening at Parmi, our honorable guest, US Ambassador Scott Maslow, will give a talk on leadership in a rapidly changing world. Before we start, I would like to explain a short biography of Mr. Scott Maslow. Mr. Scott Maslow is the US Ambassador to the Republic of Union of Myanmar. Mr. Scott Masio previously served as the Department of State Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs from August 2013 to February 2016. Mr. Scott Masio also served as the Ambassador to the Republic of Indonesia, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and Ambassador to the ASEAN Affairs. Ambassador Scott Masio, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, joined the department in 1985. His assignments include Director of the Office of Maritime Southeast Asia, Director of the Office of Mainland Southeast Asia, Director of the Office of Southeastern Europe. Ambassador Scott Masio also has served in Vietnam, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Brazil, and Turkey, as well as in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs Office of Monetary Affairs. Ambassador Scott Masio is a graduate of the UC Davis and Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Domino, the Executive Director of Parmi Institute, to the stage to explain about Parmi Leadership Program. All right, thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for coming to this evening's event. And I'm extremely honored to have Ambassador Scott Marcio to come to uh, talk about this extremely needed um, concept of um, leading the world in, in this kind of uncertain, um, uncertain times. So um, first of all, I'd like to explain to you about Parmi Institute and our activity. Um, our flagship program of Parmi Institute is a Parmi leadership program, and this leadership program is designed to nurture critical thinking, interdisciplinary analysis, and articulate communication among the Myanmar youth. We recruit 16 to 20 extremely outstanding um, graduates from Myanmar University, and um, we provide kind of learning that I received at Bard College and a lot of my friends and my colleagues received at many liberal arts and sciences colleges in the United States, the types of courses that really make you think at a deeper level. Okay? And that's extremely important for us because um, in Myanmar universities, as all of you know, uh, we focus on rote learning. Okay? If you ask a question, that will be taken as an inquisitive, but disobedient. Very, very disobedient behavior among, um, in, in your schools. So we want to flip that kind of learning into an active learning, right, in, in this Parmi Institute. So students are, are exposed to many different kinds of fields. Um, I teach science, and there are three other professors who teach economics, global cultures, and political science. In all of these courses, the major mode of learning is discussion. Okay? We don't lecture them. We provide the opportunities for students to engage in participation. And in fact, we forcefully encourage them to do so as well. So our students have to write a lot of papers, reports, in which they will have to go deeper to analyze the various, various topics. So I'll give you an example. Right? Um, in my science class, we talked about evolution a lot. And in the topic of evolution, um, students had to study molecular level of evolution all the way to morphological, behavioral, and the physical changes in animals, etc. And the students have to write about the evolutionary explanation on suicide. Okay, who would guess that a suicide has had an evolutionary advantage? 
but they have to go that kind of level to be able to engage in the topics. So other professors also have the various papers and essays in which they, the students also have to go deeper in concepts. Um, I have read from a lot of my students that this is the first time that they have ever written a 2,000 word essay, and I'm very proud that our students can now do that. It, it was quite a stretch, but they did it. I'm very proud. Um, the, at the end of this Parmi leadership program, in which there's a lot of experiential learning, in addition to classroom learning, the students will be placed in competitive jobs in Myanmar, in Yangon, thereby adding value to these students and the job market in Myanmar as well. Uh, the second program, uh, before I go to that, uh, let me explain that um, the, at the end of the program, the student will receive a certificate recognized by two American liberal arts colleges as well. And our aim is to establish a not-for-profit private liberal arts and sciences university in the future. And we hope to do that in the next two or three years as well. So please help us in that regard. The second program of Harvey Institute is Harvey Talk Series, which you are now part of. This is a public event geared towards um, opening op opportunities to a lot of uh, young, uh, eager uh, Myanmar students, as well as uh, other stakeholders in education and in businesses as well. So that's uh, the second program. And the third program we have is Parmi Conference, which we'll hope to do in the, in the very near future as well. And Parmi Conference is together a lot of educators in Myanmar to come to Parmi Institute so that we can work um, by brainstorming on how to improve Myanmar's education in a more systematic manner. So uh, these are the brief descriptions of Parmi Institute's activities. And with that, I would like to end my description on that and welcome our ambassador, Mr. Scott Marcio, to the stage. Thank you very much. My first visit to Parami Institute, uh, but I'm very excited by what you do in great for Myanmar. And um, thank you all for taking time out on a Saturday evening. It, it kind of puts a lot of pressure on me because I probably won't be as interesting as most other things you'll do on a Saturday evening, but I'll try. Um, uh, John Toon told me that I had a choice. I could either write a 2,000 word essay <laughs> or come and speak, and I was terrified of, giving a, of writing a 2,000 word essay, so here I am. Um, it's a great opportunity for me because I'm not going to talk about American foreign policy and US Myanmar relations, even though those are very important subjects. Um, what I'd like to do in the spirit of what Prami Institute is trying to do here is to talk a little bit based on my own experience of, of really living in seven different countries around the world, uh, being a diplomat for a little over 30 years, having a chance to meet a lot of amazing leaders and learn from them, um, to learn, talk a little bit about my sense of how do you lead, how do you work in today's world, um, as opposed to the world that I started my career. Um, when I started uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, you know, it was a completely different era, it was a completely different uh, world. Um, we didn't have internet. We were in the Cold War. The Soviet Union was, was our enemy. We didn't, we never heard of HIV AIDS. We never heard of climate change. Um, and all the technologies that we all take for granted today, all the things that connect us around the world, many of those didn't exist. Uh, in my first diplomatic assignment in the Philippines, I remember um, every six months I could afford to call home to the U.S. once. It was too expensive, um, right? And now we FaceTime with our daughters in the U.S. whenever we want. Um, so, as you all know, the world's changed tremendously in the last 35 years. And the pace of change is increasing. And it's going to continue to increase. 
it's going to continue to change faster. And so what that means, whether you're a student, a diplomat, a business person, is we have to adapt to this changing world. Um, and so what I'd like to do tonight is really just offer a few ideas based on, again, what I've learned from a lot of really impressive leaders around the world, uh, of some things that we all should be thinking about. I have a lot of paper here, but I don't really, it's just there so in case I forget what I want to talk about, I can look and find it. Um, so what's key going forward? The first thing is exactly what Brown Institute is doing. It's education, and it's not road education. It's not memorization. It's learning how to think and how to think critically. Um, and the reason that's important, I'll, I'll just cite my own time. I studied international relations 35 years ago. Um, what did I learn about? I learned about the Cold War, the Soviet Union. Um, I learned about apartheid in South Africa. Um, I learned that Burma was a military dictatorship. Um, so that was interesting at the time. Very few of those facts help me right now. But what helps me is that I learned how to, how to read, not just how to read, but how to read good, and how to assess information, how to ask questions, how to learn. And that's really what it comes down to, is learning how to learn. Because going forward, we're all, we don't have the luxury anymore, if we ever did, of getting our degree from university and saying, okay, we're finished with our studies. In the world of today, and increasingly in the world of tomorrow, we're going to have to continue our education, formally or informally, throughout our careers. But the business degree, or the international relations degree, or the literature degree that you get when you're uh, young is very helpful, but you're going to have to constantly refresh and learn new things and probably change your career two or three times. You can only do that, you can't do that based on what you memorized at university. You can only do that if you've got that skill set, particularly the skills to think critically, to read, absorb, and know where to get information. And that's why I'm so happy to see what Trauma Institute is doing. So that's lesson one. I'm kind of lucky in my job because every three years they pick us up and throw us in a different country and just say, learn everything about it. Um, and um, Learn the not only what's going on in politics, you have to learn the history, you have to learn the culture, you have to learn the people. Um, so we get thrown in every few years to a completely different environment. It's fantastic. I never get bored. Um, and so that's a great opportunity to kind of crash courses every three or four years. Um, you know, I went from the Philippines to Brazil, my wife thing. Uh, they're slightly different cultures, different history. Then we went to Vietnam. Uh, then we went to Turkey. And we went to Indonesia. And then we came here. Um, you know, each place fascinating, interesting, but we got to start almost at the beginning every time. A second point that I really want to emphasize, and, and maybe this is obvious, is we all have a tendency to get stuck in the way we think sort of assume that the world that we see today, maybe that's been the world we've seen for the last 20 years, is going to be the same in 20 years. Guess what? It's not. It's not. The world's changing quickly. And what that means is we have to constantly question our assumptions, constantly ask ourselves. I'll give you a couple of examples from my own experience. Um, when I graduated from high school, the war in Vietnam had just ended. A traumatic experience for the United States. Um, troops came home uh, and we considered Vietnam our enemy. Fifteen years later, I went to Hanoi to open the first U.S. diplomatic office after the war. And uh, my, my uh, late father-in-law, I remember he said, you're going to Vietnam, isn't it dangerous? This is 1992. I said, no, why? He said, well, the war. 
I said, the war ended 17 years ago. But people were still, people in America still thought of Vietnam, they thought of the war. So we went, we established relations, and now guess what? We have a great relationship, a booming relationship with Vietnam. But it was only because both countries and both people were able to adjust and, and understand that it didn't always have to be the way it had been. Let's talk about Myanmar. Ten years ago, I was in Washington responsible for Southeast Asia. The Saffron Revolution had just happened. There was a lot of unhappiness in the United States. I think there was a fair amount here, too. We were imposing more and more sanctions on the government here, trying to force change. Um, a year later, I was here, just after Cyclone Argus devastated so much of the country, to offer assistance. It was the first assistance we offered uh, in a long time. And then, a few years later, of course, things began to change here. And now I'm here as ambassador in a country that we consider a good friend. Um, that we're really excited about. But again, it's only because both countries, both people were able to adjust their thinking. And it's only I have to say, um, because President Obama <clears throat> saw an opening and took a risk. He got a lot of criticism. You're rushing ahead too fast with Myanmar. Let's wait and see if things really change. But sometimes in life, you've got to see the opportunity. So having that mindset of being open to change, looking for opportunity, and then seizing it. Is it's always been important, but I think it's even more important these days. And the same, I, I've been talking about diplomacy, the same is true everything that is like in business. Right? We've seen this especially in technology. Right? The technology, when I was in high school, people, we, we played, I had an eight track tape player in my car. I don't know if anyone even knows what an eight track tape player was. It seemed like great technology at the time, but if you were, if you were the company invested a lot in that money, in that technology, we lost everything. Because it was taken, you know, overtaken in no time. Um, my colleague John Bush at the NC reminded me uh, not that many years ago, Sony dominated television with its Trinitron uh, GV technology. But guess what? When new technology came, Sony said, oh, Trinitron's really good. Nothing's going to be better than Trinitron. So they held on to it. Guess what? They've gone from a dominant market share to a small market share. Um, but the other point, it's not just the technology. Your competitor today might be your partner tomorrow. And of course, your partner today might be your competitor tomorrow. So again, we always have to be thinking that let's not assume that the way things are today is going to be the way they are tomorrow. They're going to change, and you have to be ready for it. And related to that, um, and this is sort of a vague concept, so forgive me if I don't explain it very well, but because the world is changing so much, we have to constantly push ourselves out of what we in the United States would call our comfort zone. You know, like a comfort zone where you do the same thing every day, and you don't try anything new, and you don't try to learn a new language or visit a new place. We've got to push ourselves, all of us. We've got to make sure that we don't get stuck in that comfort zone. We've got to travel, we've got to try to learn a new language or learn something new, maybe to learn a new technology or learn to take a class in the evening. Um, not just become to be smarter, but to keep our brains nimble. Constantly have to be pushing ourselves. And um, related to this is, I think it's what, ironic how many people have talked about this. Even with the information revolution, many people are becoming more rigid in their thinking. It's, it doesn't make sense because now we have so many more sources of information, it should help us. But what happens is a lot of us, we, now you can find, if, if you want to watch news, for example, let's say in the United States, you can find news that fits your thinking. In the old days, there was just the news, whether you agreed with it or not. Now. If I feel a certain way about certain issues, I can just go and pick the news and the information that supports my view. This is a growing problem in the United States. People are getting, in some ways, more rigid in their thinking despite the availability of more information because it's natural, I think, uh, human nature to be reassured that the way we think is the right way. 
Unfortunately, with that, when that happens, we start to see the people who disagree with us, not only as people who have a different view, but what's wrong with those people? Why don't they love their country as much as I love my country? And, and you can become polarized. And this is, we're seeing this in the United States. We're seeing this in a lot of countries. So again, it's an example where we have to force ourselves out of our comfort zone and make sure that we're open to new ideas and constantly questioning our assumptions. This is really true. I know I keep saying this, but is that do I really believe this and why? Uh, so it's really important. In meanwhile, I'm going to speak very bluntly. I hope you don't mind. Um, you've got this tremendous resource, which is your diversity. So we have it too. We have tremendous diversity. It's, our, it's in my view, our greatest strength in America. Um, but diversity is also a challenge. And in your country, because you've had conflict among different groups in the past, and, and sometimes even today, um, diversity can be, I think, will be a great asset, but it's going to require a lot of work. It's going to require a lot of people to get out of their comfort zone and reach out to different people, travel to different places. One of my colleagues at the embassy, she's, she's bum on. She's great. She's terrific, well-educated. So we've traveled a little bit um, to Kachin, to Chin, to Rakhine, to Shan, to various places. Um, and she told me it's completely changed her thinking about her about the relationship between the ethnic groups and the Bon uh, people. So again, we all have to find ways to get out and experience new things and think about. Well, I travel around your country. I'm lucky I'm able to travel all over the country. Um, you know, if I'm only in Yangon and Mexico, I'm going to have a very narrow understanding of your country. It's like going to the United States and only being in Washington, D.C. and New York. A lot of Americans will say, that's not real America. And here it's the same, right? If you're in Yangon and you're in Naypyidaw, it's not. I mean, you've got to get around and talk to a lot of different people and find out, to hear from different people. Not, not that different people have the truth, but they have a different view, they have different issues, different perspectives. So the point is getting out. Um, the, the last major point I want to talk about in terms of the change is we all talk about globalization and a connected world. Um, it's really true. It's amazing these days. Again, when I started in diplomacy, we didn't talk about climate change. We didn't really talk about global health. We didn't talk about pandemics. Right? We talked about relations between countries. But these days, everything really is global. The environment, health business, education, it's all global. And if, as a leader, if you're not connected globally, you're going to fall behind. Because whatever you're doing, there are other people also doing it around the world. And you need to find ways to partner with them, understand what others are doing, learn from them. We have a great program that I, I really like that started uh, a few years ago called YSEWA, Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative. All it is, it's a network. Group that we organized among young people from throughout Southeast Asia, the ASEAN world. Um, we didn't really do much, uh, actually, and President Obama met with some of them a couple times, and that created a lot of momentum. There's now tens of thousands of people signed up, basically networking. So people from out, throughout Southeast Asia who are working on social entrepreneurship or health or education or community development. They're now all plugging in and listening, well, my friend in the Philippines is doing this, maybe we should try that. That's the way the world's going to be. So the, the, the old days when you could sort of stay at home in the United States or Myanmar and just do your business, some sort of not being connected, those days are gone. You'll be left behind. So forcing yourself to get out and be connected in some way with the world um, is really, really important. Um, Okay, so I've been talking about all the things that have changed and how we have to be really adaptable, flexible, constantly on the ball. Now I want to talk about a few things that shouldn't change in my view. First is your integrity, your ethics, your principles. We all have them. 
staying true to those principles, being honest, having integrity, and standing up for what you believe in, that hasn't changed in a rapidly changing world. And in fact, it's even, I'd say, argue, it's more important than ever. So everyone will define that differently. Um, for me, it matters like integrity. So when, I like to play golf, even though I'm not very good, but a good friend of mine in Indonesia gave me this really nice driver. I really wanted to keep it. I couldn't. We're not allowed to keep gifts. And I thought, well, maybe you know, nobody will really know. It's not that expensive. And, you know, no, I can't. Because if you start to cheat a little bit, you're cheating. You can't. You have to say zero tolerance for those kinds of things, whether it's taking gifts or violating whatever the rules are in your organization or in your own head. But it's also standing up for what you believe in. Um, We've got a lot of great examples in this country, led by the Aung San Suu Kyi, and the more than 100 members of parliament who spent years as political prisoners fighting for what they believe in. Uh, they made much greater sacrifice for their country than I ever made for my country. I admire them greatly. Doesn't mean you have to agree with all their policies or think that they're great politicians, but wow, I really admire those people. That's tremendous courage and integrity. It's just as important now as ever. The other thing that hasn't changed, in my view, is whatever business you're in or whatever type of work you're doing, um, it's still always a matter of achieving actual results. Right? I mean, I come from the world of diplomacy where we love to talk endlessly and say we were successful because we had a good meeting. Um, but Talking is only important as a means. In the end, you've got to achieve results in any business, right? Any organization. It only matters. I always ask people, okay, I know you worked really hard. What did you do to make the world a better place? It may be in a very small way, but that's what really matters. It's not how hard you work. Nobody cares how hard you work. Love my care, but that's not it's what difference did you make? What did you achieve? And maybe for your company or your organization, it, there's a lot of different ways of measuring it. But that hasn't changed either. That's still the case today. And I'll give one example of a guy who amazed me at his ability to get things done in government. It's President Jokowi of Indonesia. Uh, when I was in Indonesia, he was the governor of Jakarta. And he was a very simple guy, flew economy class in the last seat of the airplane, still does. Um, and I went out with him once, and he was talking about, um, you know, government is really hard sometimes to get things done. He was talking about the need to drain the canals in Jakarta. He said, we have flooding because the canals aren't current. I said, what, do you need money? He said, no, we have a budget. That's not the problem, it just doesn't get done. But we're gonna fix that. I said, okay, how do you fix that? He said, it's simple, it just takes the oil. I call up the head of the drilling company, of the dredging company, and I say, tomorrow we're going to dredge this canal. I will meet you there at 8 o'clock. And Joe Bully was there. And if that guy wasn't there, he was going to be in a lot of trouble. But so he didn't just say, pick up the phone or ask one of his aides to ask that it get done. He called the guy and says, let's meet, I'll, I'll meet you there at 8 o'clock tomorrow. And he was there. And that's how he got things done. It was remarkable. Um, the last point I want to make is, um, and this is like, again, in, in the third item of things that haven't changed, is teamwork. That hasn't changed. The idea that it's not about us as individuals, but that all of us, in some ways, work as part of a team. Um, so that means, obviously, working uh, collegially with your colleagues. It also means trying to check our egos so that we don't worry about who gets credit. In the U.S., there's an old saying that there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't worry about who gets to credit. Um, I have a hard time with this. I like to get credit. Um, one time we were in Vietnam and we had the first ever visit by the U.S. Secretary of State in Hanoi. 
and we were trying to think of something unique or different for him to do. So I suggested that we get him together with the university student, which in Vietnam at that time was unheard of. And we did it. And then I found out later that several of the people I worked for claimed it as their idea. It really bothered me, really made me mad. And then somebody, one of my bosses who didn't even pay for it, he said, look, we got it done. It was your idea. That's not what matters. What matters is we did something good that made a difference. And that's what it's all about. That's what we have to remember. Um, I still struggle with this, but I do try to remember that. Um, so bottom line is that all the change in the world means that we've really got to be constantly pushing ourselves to learn, to think critically, to ask questions, to be prepared, to look for opportunities. But at the same time, we've got to hold on to some of those old traditional values of you know, ethics and integrity <coughs> and teamwork and being results oriented. Um, that, in a nutshell, is what I've learned about leadership in a changing world. Um, I probably talked way too long. Um, this is supposed to be a conversation. Uh, so I'd be happy to, really delighted to hear from you, either your ideas on this subject or questions or since we're thinking critically, feel free to disagree and uh, speak critically of my ideas. That's good too. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott Marcia. Now we would like to welcome question from the audience. I would like to mention that we have 20 minutes for questions and answer section. My name is Min, and uh, I'm a consultant. And you know, thanks for thanks for giving us a good you know uh, uh, background of yourself and really getting to. It's good that I rearranged my schedule to actually attend. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Uh, quick question is: You've seen many countries change. Even the U.S. has changed a lot. Uh, where do you see there's pitfalls? There's a lot of uh, good and bad things about change. You know, people will say, "Oh, it's changing, it's changing, it's changing." But there's good ways to change, and there's not so good ways to change. So if you could definitely give us a good uh, a background of where you've seen different changes and how you can see uh, where we could be in a little bit of uh, hot water for, and depending on how how things should progress. Sure. No, it's a, it's a really important question, and there's no easy answer. Um, you know, we, we always say we want to see progress. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, in a place like Myanmar, to me, you want peace. Uh, you want stronger democracy. And you want um, an economy growing in a way that brings a lot of people up, not just a few people, right? Um, so you, you, uh, you're right. You can see uh, change that's harmful, change that's um, that's, that's positive, and usually you get some of each. You rarely get 100% good change. Sometimes you get 100% bad, but not, not too often, unfortunately. Um, so I would say today in Myanmar, I think, I mean, I first came here in 2005, and the change has been amazing, and for the most part, extremely good. Um, but like everyone else that didn't have freedom and now has freedom, Freedom also gives the opportunity for small group of people to make trouble. And when I say make trouble, I don't mean waving signs or protesting, but spreading the vision. And we've been struggling in the United States for 240 years to build harmony in a diverse place. We're still struggling. And the struggle never really ends. Um, but I think that's a huge challenge for a place like Myanmar. Uh, again, how do you, do you build the strength? when you have a lot of great people out there spreading positive messages, but some people spreading the vision. Uh, and in a, in a free environment, that's a challenge uh, to protect. The other uh, risk, of course, in any place that's going through major reform on the economic side is that a small number of people benefit. Right? We saw this in the former Soviet Union and Russia when uh, with reforms and opening the economy took off with a really small number of people earned huge amounts of money, and the average person didn't benefit. 
So those are just a couple of the things. And the other obvious one is if you have rapid economic growth, you can have environmental problems. And I, I don't want to be critical of our neighbor to the north here, but I think the Chinese would admit that they have. I mean, they have phenomenal success. I really admire what they've done, but the environmental costs have been really high. Uh, what about Vietnam? Can, can you give a little bit of uh, How about Vietnam? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, how about in the case of Vietnam? You know, just so that we have a slight comparison with the yeah. Southeast Asian. Yeah, I mean, I think Vietnam overall has done quite, quite well in terms of development, growth, etc. Um, it has not been able to achieve the political reforms and freedom that I think a lot of Vietnamese uh, people would like, and it's also struggled very much with corruption. Uh, and Vietnamese will tell you, I mean, Vietnamese officials will acknowledge that corruption is a is a huge problem that's slowing them down. Problem of corruption, vested interest that gets in the way of the reform that could take the country a lot further forward. Um, Saru from PDAS. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for very positive and encouraging talk. I mentioned about great diversity in Myanmar. This is a strength. But it requires a lot of work. But I agree with you. But then here, if we could put the library a bit more on that, or if we have suggestion, what would be the right step to take to do this in, in terms of um, ethnic diversity where we can use it? Yeah. Um, sure. I, I, I won't try to say what the recipe is for getting it right, because I think that's really something that only the Myanmar people. And decide. Um, but you've got nearly 55 million people in the country, 135 official ethnic groups, and many probably more uh, unofficial, as well as many different religions. But because of the way history has worked here, um, people, there's a lot of mistrust. And in many cases, um, people don't have an opportunity for a lot of interaction among ethnic groups. So when we talk about federalism now, people are talking about federalism, there's a tendency I hear for people to say, well, federalism means that the Kachin people rule Kachin, the Shan people rule Shan, the Mon people rule Mon, etc. Um, that doesn't really work, right? Why? Because you go to Shan, how many different ethnic groups are in Shan? Is it only the Shan people who can rule it? In Kachin, there's a big Shan population too. Is it right for just the Kachin to rule it? I'm not singling out these groups to be critical. It's just, this is where critical thinking really comes in. You have to, when people say that, well, we want federalism so that each state, each ethnic group has its own state, that's when you have to wait and say, wait a minute, how would that really work? What about the rights of the top old people in China? Right? I, I don't know what the answer is, but there's a need for a dialogue, probably a long dialogue, not just by the government but by the people, to sort of say, how do we want to try to make this work um, in a way that we can be unified as a nation, still respect everyone's culture, people can have the opportunity to enjoy their culture, their language, their food as they should, um, but also feel that they're treated equally with equal rights. It's a big challenge. Um, again, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I'm sure of one thing, it does require very serious long-term dialogue among the whole society. Not just government will play an important role, but it's not going to be solved just by the government. Uh, and I, th I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to start talking about that in, in many different forms. Yes. Maria Nasmarez. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my question is in terms of technological adaptation or adapting technology to the workplace. Uh, particularly, we see more adaptation in the private sector naturally, uh, but we also see that the government entities are much slower in adapting such technologies. Uh, my question is to you, as you being in other countries, uh, 
should it be promoted to have some of these uh, public and private institutions to use more technology and to train them? In other words, should we force the acceleration? Should we let it just be as it may be? Or uh, should we even step back a little bit? Uh, and by that I mean that technology is a great tool, but we also know that it can have a lot of backlash as technology tends to also displace some people from job opportunities. As more technology is implemented, uh, you need less people to do more work more efficiently. And we know that some folks, as you've been saying, from the rural areas, uh, have been living a very different lifestyle uh, with no technology and that they may be not there yet ready for a lot of these technology uh, advances to be used in the workplace. So uh, do you think, well, this is more a question of what should be the pace, really, because it's inevitable. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm over 50 and I work for the government, so I can tell you that I'm probably the worst person in the world to talk about adapting to technology. Um, I mean, I think it's here. The technology is coming. I mean, it would be a huge mistake to try, in my view, to slow it down or the government not to try to seize it and use it. I mean, I think there's a lot, if you're talking about government, there's a lot of things that have been proven to work, right? Electronic payment of government employee salaries, for example. Um, right, money goes right to them. There's no middleman. Uh, there's transparency. Takes out corruption. Um, a lot can be done in government forms that can be filled out electronically. And even in rural areas, right? You can go to the Iowa Delta and talk with rice farms, as I did recently, and a, a remarkable number of people have smartphones. Right? They may not be the most technological, technologically adept people in the world, but imagine. And they also say boy, we could really use extension services, help from the government, right? So imagine if the, if the regional or state or union uh, department ministry of agriculture is able to provide useful information by, by smartphone. You know, hey, this is the time you should be fertilizing, or this, we've just heard that there's a major storm coming, or whatever it may be. So I think there's some proven technology. If the government's probably not the place to do leading edge technology so much, but I think there's a lot of proven technology that can be quite quickly and easily uh, adapted and used by government. So I, I think absolutely. And I think uh, it's an area where government and, and business ought to be able to work together. And maybe you start in one region, just you know, pilot program and make sure that it can work uh, and then go from there. Well, thanks, Ambassador, for your speech. Um, my name is Ning. I'm a PhD student um, in international relations uh, from Tsinghua University, taking a visiting at the University of Yangon here. And I was lucky enough to um, see uh, your colleague, uh, Mr. Ryan Hasselberg. Uh, he gave a speech on uh, US policy in Southeast Asia. And it was um, nice to hear how he communicated with other students in here. So you also talked about uh, just now how uh, traveling changed your uh, from my colleague's mindset, bringing different perspective to her or him. And um, my question is like, what can what do you think can be done to change the students' uh, mindset if they don't? Most of them don't have the privilege to travel around, even in their own country. Yes, the budget for like yeah, mostly. Um, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I think there's a couple of things. Um, we have at the embassy a, a youth council. It's a, a, a small group of, of, of very bright young people who, who we meet with pretty regularly to give us advice. They're talking about on their own organizing student exchanges uh, between you know Mama regions and different ethnic areas. Um, I think there's things that can be done. You know, they don't you don't necessarily have to go to. I went to Chin State recently. Love Chin State. It's great. It's kind of hard to get to. So I think there are places that might be easier for people uh, to get to uh, and, and that's doable. Um, I think again, it's not my place to recommend to the government. I actually think 
education, right? I mean, when I grew up in the United States, um, our the history I learned of America was the history of white men. You just kind of left everybody else out. Um, I've heard a lot of friends here, particularly the ethnic minorities, complain that the history of Neymar is not inclusive, to put it that way. Um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, give people the opportunity to learn different languages. Even experiment a little bit, learn some ethnic languages. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done. You, you, know, you don't have to become a world leading expert on a different region or something, but just that little bit of exposure um, is, is uh, an important opportunity. Setting up um, Facebook groups. You know, people can meet and then you can find on Facebook. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, so I think about that, um, from, from your um, California, well, we've got a couple of Burmese students together to um, organize a team. And they've already set up a virtual platform for uh, Burmese, uh, all these Burmese students. It's already happening. We have a virtual platform like yeah, it's um, 360 TV camera. And we've got that thing. You feel like you are like differently there, <coughs> learning and participating the whole entire, a whole new atmosphere, a whole new place. And it's happening here. The majority is coming in. This is already happening. And I'm talking about that already. I just found out, I, I was, I came out of my, oh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I came out of my comfort zone. I drove down the day already. By the way, hi, hi all. I'm Dr. Sh Dr. Shane from um, born and raised in Burma. Um, but most of my, I spent like six years in the US and I just came back like over a year ago to start um, a drug free clinic. So, like homeopathic clinic. That's like something new here. Well, that, that's me. We'll talk about it later. So, uh, yeah, there's, we, we've already have, um, I've seen. An, an app that that um, that what you just mentioned about these farmers and farming and agricultural messages and so things happen. Um, yeah. People uh, just want to let you guys know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uber is just here like a few days ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Got a question. Hello. Hello. Okay, thank you for having us. You have a chance to see you. To have met, uh, to meet you. Scan time. I was like, I'm not going to have this for them times. Right now, what I want to ask you is that I'm not telling this. I'm pleased that I have read about a ticket online of these things. This is about the Whistle Project, which is still in a way that is involved. And it is depends on the commission percent. So when I read this one, what I really thought about was that, as I as we mentioned before, I need to put the thinking as being a, one, uh, one of my favorite clients. I thought like that. What I would do if I were the person you know, to know me. I thought a lot and you know, I discussed about this project with my friends who are also clients of also many different islands at the Lincoln Center or everywhere else will be released. So what I what I want you to answer is that what would you do if you want the party of Myanmar for the project? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. To be honest, um, what what's the project? I can't really explain it. Um, what would you do if you want the party of Myanmar for the Muslim project? Which is which is yeah, which is the then I wouldn't say no to my intervention commission. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm a diplomat. There's no way in the world I'm going to answer that. <laughs> Actually, uh, to be honest, you know, I believe in your leadership skills. Your leadership skills. Because if you were being in a leadership skills, you know, for several years, especially, you know, in South Asia, Asia. So I, uh, I thought, you know, in, when I was listening to your speech, I was asking questions. 
no best word to raise in that time. I, no, I feel like asking you and yeah. Oh, look, it's a very legitimate question. And I'm not being critical. But it's an extremely sensitive issue that does not involve the United States. And for me, publicly, to say this or that should happen, uh, I think would not really be appropriate. It's not that it's not a good question. It's a very good question. But it's just not one that the U.S. ambassador, even in a setting like this, really should comment on. So sorry, because you know, for, for me, was you know, I thought you know, Anshu was that question because you know, it is it is a very bit sensitive. Actually, there are many people who are you know really worried about that because yeah. it is likely to be continued. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's a very fair question. Okay. So I like to Okay. Hi, I'm Thomas Brickner, and I work for Chow Street Foundation. So. Uh, the department that I uh, oversee uh, works in four countries, one of which is Myanmar, and we're particularly concerned about um, how we can best support the development of leadership in youth today. So I'm uh, aware you're very well traveled, and I uh, would like to know what do you think we, as one of the many civil society organizations, how can how can we support the development of leadership in youth? Um, I think it's a big challenge. Uh, it's a big challenge in every country, right? In the United States, every, everybody everywhere is asking how can we better prepare our young people to deal with the type of job skills and the other skills uh, to do well. It's certainly true here, and particularly because this place was, you know, the education system suffered here for so long. So I think most people agree that the education system needs a lot of work. So over the long term, there's a lot of education that needs to happen, curriculum, better training the teachers, all those sorts of things. Um, what I would say right now, though, is what people are most hungry for, in my experience, is the exposure. The exposure to things that they haven't had a chance to be exposed to yet. They're just different experiences. Uh, I mean, this is one of the great things I really like about Parami, and I, I didn't get to come here to the paid advertisement for Parami Institute, but right, they're, they're giving people this great experience, this sort of boost um, of really quality work. And I think because long-term education reform takes a long time by definition, that looking for areas where you can have a shorter-term impact, and I think by definition it's with smaller groups. Um, finding, in you know, my view, this is a very personal, finding places where people are really already doing good work, very committed, um, I was at a great school, uh, monastery school in Mandalay uh, about a month ago. Um, John? Um, Hongawu. Hongawu. Yeah, really great school, right? It's these two brothers who run these monks. It's really impressive. They, they're, they're teaching critical thinking, same kinds of things. My view is you find things like that where people already have the good idea, but just need a little bit more support rather than trying to create it out of nothing. I mean, that, that may be stating the obvious, but I think there's a lot of a lot of creative, good people here in this country doing good work. It's a matter of helping them just do a little bit more, reach a few more people. Now I would like to invite one last question. My name is Sylvia. Thank you very much, Parami Institute, for bringing this show. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Parsman. Um, it's really interesting show, interesting talk here. Um, I'm doing quite a lot of monitoring evaluation. I have a few years here in Myanmar, also like three years in Africa. I've been seeing a lot of changes in the only three years. Yeah, with your experience more than 20 years, it might be hundreds of experience, a lot of change you have been I wanted to um, specifically highlight the education because for me is that you also would like to maybe we like to discuss about more in deep I was interested. Uh, what are the uh, yes you are here like that minutes plus right in Myanmar? And what are the what are the changes? Would, did you really see it? Could you please highlight what are the changes between the 
collaboration and cooperation in the education center between the U.S. and the state of Myanmar. Thank you very much. Um, what I see is, in a way, goes back to something I said earlier uh, in, my, in my remarks, that, um, you know, that when, when for so many years the, the links between America and Myanmar were so limited uh, because of what was happening here and because of our policy. So now that things have opened up, we're seeing all kinds of different institutions in both countries reach out to each other. So we're seeing a number of universities uh, and other um, education institutions in the United States coming here and establishing links with Myanmar institutions, often universities. Uh, and um, I think that's probably the most important change I see that those links didn't exist very much up until quite recently. We're continuing to do our part from the embassy with things like Fulbright program, where we bring academics from the US to here or from here to the United States. Uh, and trying to promote more also students in both places. Um, so I think it's just the, the growth and the development of relationships between education institutions, uh, which were really non-existent a few years ago, is the biggest change I see. And it creates a huge number of opportunities. Thank you. I think we have time for one. You may have a quick one, right? Yeah, quick one. Godfrey, uh, you can also call me Winnie. Uh, just a quick question. I think uh, you know I've lived half my life here and half my life in the U.S. And uh, you know I, I think that the world has gotten better uh, over the last four decades. Um, but recent events, you know, uh, in democratic countries like the U.S. and the Europe and uh, UK, and now what's unfolding in France, so that got us thinking. Uh, you know, the, is the democracy sufficient enough uh, to keep the world safe in the next 20 years? And uh, the question really is more about, you know, when you have what you talk about, the technological advances and the ability for us to actually get the news that we want, the customization of the truth, when those things are happening at the same time, we got so much uh, weapons of mass destruction. You know, the, the delta, the sigma to the uh, amalgam is so close. Uh, is democracy you know, running out of steam? And if democracy are to keep us safe, how do you think it should it evolve? That was a quick question. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm just going to tell you what I think. Um, what I think is, you know, Democracy is always going to be challenged. It's always a struggle. I keep telling people say, oh, you know, uh, someone in my embassy came to me and said, oh, they read that America was an imperfect democracy. Of course it is. Um, I don't think it was a perfect democracy. So there's always challenges. Um, and there have been challenges throughout. Um, I, I can certainly speak for my country. I'm very confident about the strength of democracy uh, in our country. Um, because people are very committed to it and there's a deep reservoir of support um, for that. But it is a constant challenge and it you know, requires all of us um, to do our part. I mean, I think that's the, that's the thing I, that I, I, it's getting a little bit away from something we were talking about earlier, but in you know the countries I've lived in and worked in, there's often a tendency for people to say, when's the government going to fix this? You know what? I've worked with government for a long time. Governments are essential. They do a lot of good things. But don't wait for the government to fix things. Right? Um, it's, it's people. It's communities. And this is where it, it sounds like a cliche, but I think it's really true. You know, it's really the community spirit. That's where you can make a difference, and that's including on, on fighting to preserve the strength of democracy, because it's always going to be under attack. It's always going to be challenged. Um, and the nature of that challenge changes from time to time. Um, but I think if you look at, you know, I'm a student of history, if you look at our history, there's been all kinds of turbulent times in our history and most other countries. And it's a matter of people really rallying and supporting democracy. I think that's what makes me uh, very hopeful. Thank you. Thank you all.
Scott Maskell and the audience is for your question. May I invite uh, Mr. Scott Maskell back into the stage to receive a, a token of appreciation? And may I invite Mr. Wing Yu, Director of Development of Parmi Institute, to, to the stage to give a token of appreciation to him this time.